In this video, we'll take a look at some highlights of women's physical health, as well as illnesses and risk factors. In most places around the world, feminine attractiveness is still equivalent with frailty. And there are these concepts that require women to sacrifice movement, health and well-being for beauty. Women are often characterized as weak, and in many cultures they are discouraged from developing their own strengths. Let's look at a romantic example that is still used in small circles today, the side saddle, and the challenge for a woman to ride that way. A woman using a side saddle put her left leg in an ordinary stirrup, then swung her right leg over and hooked it into a pommel on the left side of the saddle. In this way, both legs were kept modestly close together and covered by a skirt. Now, then the woman had to compensate for the lopsided distribution of her weight and also twist her torso to face forward, causing considerable extra strain on her muscles. Not surprisingly, women riders forced to use this type of saddle tired more quickly than men, thus preserving the myth of feminine frailty and masculine strength. There are many safety and health concerns in keeping women fragile and frail and not necessary. And yet we know women who are accustomed to the task, for example, the women in this photo, can carry very heavy loads, walk many, many miles, and do a big bolt of the physical labor in a community. For any of you that work in health and healing, or for that matter, exercise or play a sport, you know that physical activity can improve your health. Physical activity provides the following benefits. It reduces the risk of dying from heart disease and stroke. It lowers the risk of getting heart disease, stroke, and high blood pressure, colon cancer, and diabetes. It lowers high blood pressure. It keeps your bones, muscles, and joints healthy. It reduces anxiety and depression and improves one's mood. It helps an individual better handle and manage stress. It helps control the weight. It protects against falling and bone fractures in older adults. It may help protect against breast cancer. It helps control joint swelling and pain from arthritis. It gives a person more energy. It helps you to sleep better. And it helps you to look better. So there are very few, if any, downsides to physical activity for both women and men's health. And regardless of a woman's health factor, we still know that in developed countries, women live on average 80 or more years. And no country has achieved this for men. So why is that? Well, a few of the examples given are that male infants are more likely to suffer from congenital malformations and genetically transmitted diseases. We have a higher male infant mortality rate. Men have higher death rates from unintentional injuries, of suicides, of homicides, of accidents. All of these are higher for men. Males are more vulnerable to many diseases, perhaps in part because they are less likely to seek medical care. Also in part because women survive better than men do under conditions of starvation, exposure, fatigue, and shock. Now if we look at women in developing countries, their life expectancy is much less and much lower than 70 years in places like Afghanistan and Haiti, and yet well under 50 years on average in places like Botswana. Why is this? Well, we know that life expectancy is also linked to poverty, nutrition, and access to medical care, all of which in developing countries, all things that are much more likely for women than men. So what are things that are major risks for women? Launched in 1996 by the National Institute of Health, the Women's Health Initiative was a 15-year set of studies involving a diverse group of 164,500 women. They focused on the prevention of heart disease, breast and colon cancer, and osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. This is a list of their findings. Tropical diseases such as malaria increase risks of maternity mortality, and reproductive health problems are high for women 
for example, obstructed labor is 70% of maternal deaths and are often due to female genital mutilation. Heart disease and cancer are the leading causes of death for women and men, for women at 22 and 21% respectively. And yet, as we begin to look at the other risk factors and causes of death for women and men, we can begin to see how they differentiate themselves. Men have a much higher rate, as you can see, of unintentional injuries. Men are much more likely to die of violent crime than women are. Those violent deaths are almost always at the hands of other men. Men kill men. We will explore how men kill women when we look at Chapter 13 and Violence Against Women and Girls. As we move from a U.S. view to a global view, we can see the World Health Organization's list of global deaths for women. We see that Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia are higher for women. And researchers postulate that that may have something to do with the fact that women in developed countries live longer than men, and perhaps we would see higher rates for men if they lived as long as women. When we look at how people contract HIV, we see a huge disparity between males and females. As you can see from this graph, 71% of men contract HIV through male-to-male -male sexual interaction. Well, for women, that heterosexual contact makes up 69% of the way that they contract HIV. The other 29% being IUDs. As we look into male and female differences in contracting HIV through sexual contact, we can see that black men having male-to-male -male sexual contact is the highest, followed by Latino men and white men. The highest ranking group of women it is at this point that we see black women contracting HIV from heterosexual contact with their partners. So as you can see, to a greater degree, men are contracting HIV from other men, and women are contracting HIV from men as well. And this follows in line with most other sexually transmitted infections, whereas women are contracting them from having sexual intercourse with men. Osteoporosis, or porous bone, is a disease characterized by low bone mass and structural deterioration of bone tissues, leading to bone fragility and increased susceptibility to fractures, especially of the hips, spine, and wrists, although any bone can be affected. Now we see that 80% of affected people are women. We also know that there are ethnic markers that increase the rate of osteoporosis. Poor nutrition, being too thin. It's healthier for women to put on a little more weight as they age. Once a woman passes menopause, she becomes at much more risk for osteoporosis. In addition, white women are at a much higher risk than African American women for this disease. As you can see, normal bones show a pattern of strong interconnected plates of bones, but much of this is lost in osteoporosis. The remaining bones have a weaker rod-like structure and become much more frail. The progressive spinal deformity and osteoporosis can cause damage and harm to other organs in the body as well. As mentioned earlier, poverty and nutrition are highly correlated with women's health. The poorer women are, the worse their health and their health care. Women are much more likely than men to live in poverty. Remember, the one thing that ties women together more than anything else is poverty. Poverty equals inadequate nutrition, crowded and unsafe living conditions, lack of easy access to medical care, and lack of clean water. It's also highly associated with stress. As the UN said in 2009, poverty has various manifestations, including lack of income and productive resources sufficient to ensure sustainable livelihoods. Hunger and malnutrition, ill health, 
limited or lack of access to education and other basic services, increased morbidity and mortality from illness, homelessness and inadequate housing, unsafe environments, and social discrimination and exclusion. Does this description by the United Nations sound like the way a number of women live in the world? Perhaps a large amount of women live in the world. Add to poverty stressors. Psychological stress increases susceptibility to illness. And some stressful life events are much more likely for women. Rape, sexual harassment, spousal abuse, sexual discrimination. Social supports can counteract this stress, but also may backfire. Think co-rumination, women spending their time to care for rather than get the support they need. And despite mixed findings, when researchers focus on women, these benefits are seen. The tend and befriend theory talks about women nurturing their children and affiliating with others to reduce risk. The ability to provide social support is just as important for women as the opportunity to receive it, and so that combination can be really helpful. In addition, seeking help and advice. Even if women seek medical help more than men, the help they receive is not always adequate, and so a woman often needs to look at ways to take care of herself. As you can see, diet and exercise become even more important for women. Finally, we look at women in the healthcare system. We know that women are more likely than men to go to the doctor, and that they often are advocates for themselves communicating their issues to their doctors. And yet we know that doctors will often look at an illness that a woman presents and an illness that a man presents that are the same symptoms and be diagnosed in two very different ways. So there are biases that the medical system has against women. And those biases are even higher in male doctor, female patient interactions, and even higher for lesbian, poor women, or other women of color. So quality of care becomes very, very important for a woman's health and finding a doctor who understands women's health and well-being. As we know, men and women are more than 99% the same, and yet physical health, that, that less than 1% difference that has mostly to do with reproductive organs, hormones, levels of hormones, I should say, and our social constructs make a huge impact to her quality of care, her well-being. Doctor, healer, shaman, nurse, there are many names for healers in our current society and millennia before. Women have always been healers in our society, and, and yet women have regularly been shut out or kept in the margins since the rise of patriarchy 5,000 years ago. Now what's really interesting about this is the concept of nursing versus doctoring. As Mary Roth Walsh pointed out in 1977, in the late 1800s, doctors opposed the entry of women into medicine because of women's alleged physical delicacies and weaknesses, again going back to the beginning of this video around women and fail frailty. And yet those same doctors were strangely supportive of their entry into nursing for exactly those same reasons. And while women have always been healers, modern medical systems are not set up on the basis of female health, but male health. So it becomes much more important for women to be advocates for their own health and well-being.